I'm Carmine Gallo. I'm here with Kara Golden, who is the CEO and the founder of Hint, the number one flavored water in, in the U.S. A little product placement. Hello, Kara. How are you? <laughs> Hi, I'm good. How are you? I'm, I'm great, but we are here to talk about Undaunted, your new book, Overcoming Doubts and Doubters. Come on, you had me at Undaunted. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for yeah. having me. Overcoming doubts and doubters. Of course, uh, all entrepreneurs should do that. And, and I actually do like that subtitle because doubters, there's plenty of in entrepreneurship. All entrepreneurs know that it's easy to be a critic, but overcoming doubts, you're talking about the self-doubts that could derail your plans. Is that right, Kara? Yeah, well, your, your self-doubts and, and also all those doubters that come along um, and might not even be thinking that they're, you know, definitely impacting kind of, kind of how, how you even think about things going forward. But certainly when you have doubts um, a little bit, they're accelerated. Uh, doubters only throw the, the fuel on yep. the fire to sort of, you know, help you to even doubt whatever you're doing even more. I like the fact that you say it's not an autobiography, it's part business, part life lessons, but most of all things that you need to know about becoming a successful entrepreneur. And this is written by someone who is still in the trenches, growing the company from uh, you and your husband in, in the kitchen to uh, what, $150 million a year business now and 200 employees. Is that right? Yeah, a little more than that, but wow. it's uh, yeah, it's it's cranking along. So it's um, yeah, it's it's super exciting, and you know, I think more than anything, I I call myself an accidental entrepreneur because I I never really thought of even starting my own company, or you know, I wasn't the the uh, kid that said one day I'm going to go and build my own company. I, really, for me, I was I was just trying to solve a, a problem that I had around health. And that's why I, you know, decided to to do it. And, you know, I also call myself an accidental author because I didn't intend on, you know, writing a book. It was never on my bucket list. Um, but when I started journaling about four years ago, I kept all these stories. And primarily when I was out, you know, speaking or on this crazy travel schedule building hint, I felt like I would, you know, journal some of the stories that I that I had and, and really answers to questions more than anything that I would get along the way when I was out speaking around um, not only how I built it, but also kind of defining who I was and, and implying that I didn't have doubts, I never had fears, I never had failures. And uh, when I would share these stories with people about, you know, no, I definitely had doubts or I definitely had failures, let me tell you about this time. I felt like there was this energy in the room that just changed and, and people would write to me after the talk saying, gosh, that really helped me to kind of move along and, and, or stop staying still and, and just to know that there's somebody else who is maybe a little more successful now, but was where I was at at one point. So that was really the driver a year and a half ago when I finally committed to to go and becoming an author and now it's uh it's now a wall street journal bestseller it's um super exciting it, it is exciting and let's talk about some of the skills that you've learned along the way that all entrepreneurs should should know uh, one of those is communication skills uh, uh, did you major in communication at arizona state university do i recall I think I read. I did. I was. I was a. I was a major in communications um, and journalism, and also a minor in finance. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's. I think writing skills, no matter, uh, you know, what you do, um, writing skills are so critical, especially for you know just reaching out to people for um, you know thoughts or um, trying to learn. And I think that the better writer you are. Um, the better off you'll ultimately, um, you know, make out in, in the situation. So, but that, and I think, you know, I don't know if it's a skill or if it's a trait, um, but, but uh, curiosity is another thing that is, is very much a, um, I, I, I've 
I wouldn't have even said that 15 years ago when I started Hint, but now that I've met so many people and so many different, you know, founders of companies as well as, uh, as you know, not just in the food and beverage space, but also in other categories, I think that this, this uh, curiosity as well as this um, like yearning to, to really learn and kind of, and always be educating themselves and be okay with sort of like, learning as much as they can about one thing and then going back down to the bottom to a place where you're just not really sure about a lot of stuff. I mean, that seems to be kind of the consistent thread of what entrepreneurs truly enjoy. Carol, let's talk about stories and the power of storytelling and entrepreneurship. There are two stories that define so much of who you are and your company. What I'd like to do is for you to repeat those stories uh, if you're not tired of them already, but let's repeat them briefly and then break them down. First, let's share the story of how and why you started the company in the first place. Yeah, so I I was uh, not in the beverage industry. As I said, I was a you know accidental entrepreneur. I didn't. Um, I I left the tech industry. I was an executive at AOL. I ran their e-commerce and shopping partnerships for seven years and. When I decided to ultimately leave, um, it was a decision based on, you know, frankly, the fact that I was on the plane all the time and I was communicating or with my family um, constantly by cell phone versus actually being there. I lived in San Francisco. Um, the AOL was based in, in Virginia, but I was also in New York quite a bit and also just traveling all over to wherever these retailers and catalogers were to try and help them actually develop some business with them. So when I decided um, to leave after seven years, it was a billion dollars in revenue to AOL. Um, I had three kids at home under the age of four. Um, so somewhere along the way, I was able to find time to do that. But, uh, but basically, um, you know, I wanted to take some time off and I wasn't exactly sure how much time that would be um, either. But when, while I was kind of interviewing sort of casually for some tech firms in Silicon Valley, um, the key thing for me that I kept hearing was, I, we want you to do exactly what you did at AOL, but we want to like crush them, right? And I thought, I've been working my tail off for the last seven years, like building this amazing thing. I didn't leave in order to compete kind of against what I had built. And certainly I had still a lot of colleagues and friends that were still at AOL. So, you know, it just didn't make a lot of sense for me. So while that was going on, I was looking at my own health and how I wanted to lose some weight. Um, I developed terrible adult acne that I had never even had as a teenager. Um, and then also my energy levels were down and I didn't really have an excuse for my energy levels being down other than the fact that I had three young kids, but you know, I wasn't working. I mean, I, you know, I could take naps in the afternoon, all of these things that I, you know, felt like, uh, you know, I, I just couldn't figure out. So anyway, I, I knew I needed to lose some weight and maybe I would feel better if I ultimately did that. And that's when I started really paying attention to the ingredients and in food and that I was eating and counting calories. I went and saw some different doctors trying to get some sort of diagnosis that never came. Finally, one day, my Diet Coke was, was staring at me in the face. This is like my best friend. I had been, you know, like attached to it for many, many years since I was a teenager. And it was perfectly facing me with the ingredients, um, you know, sh showing, in my, showing me the ingredients. And, and I, it was like the first time that I'd really paid attention to what I was putting in my body. There were over 30 ingredients in the can. Um, at the time, it was 10 calories. It, they hadn't even gotten to sort of zero calories. I really didn't think that there was anything wrong with it, mm -hmm. um, but because it was diet, and to me, diet meant healthy. And that's when I put it to the side and just started drinking water, and um, and just as a test. And it wasn't easy because I had been drinking it for a long time. I knew I'd get some headaches, which I absolutely had, but I. I just almost went through this detox for the next few days that was like really, really hard to describe. Two and a half weeks later, I had lost some weight um, and I didn't know how much weight, but I hopped on the scale 
And I had lost 24 pounds in two and a half weeks, which I was like, this is crazy, right? And my energy levels were back. My skin had cleared up. And that's when I really looked at like the fact that like me, there's probably so many other people out there that are confused by these terms like diet or low fat or, or even drinks that are calling themselves water that actually have sweeteners in them. And so I, I, I was like really on the program now of drinking water, but also recognizing that the reason I didn't drink water was because it was so boring. And so I started slicing up fruit on my counter and, um, and throwing it in the water just or taste. And I was like, this is all I need. I just need like a little bit of fruit in the water for taste. And so I was shopping at uh, my local Whole Foods in San Francisco and kind of thinking, gosh, I wonder if there's anything like this, you know, on the shelf that I could just buy. And like I said, I saw all these kind of healthy perception versus healthy reality brands that had all these sweeteners. And I didn't want to go back to switching from diet soda to some other drink with some sweeteners in it. And so I asked the guy that was, you know, merchandising the shelves in the in Whole Foods, I said, do you have a product like this that just has fruit and water? And what I found is that I was actually educating, you know, this very intelligent person who was merchandising at Whole Foods, like that about this category. And I believed at that point, like I thought it should have been in a store like Whole Foods, this idea that I had for water with just fruit in it, but it wasn't. And um, so then I looked all over the East Coast as well to try and find the product. I couldn't find it. You know, and about a year later, I finally just decided I'm going to write the business plan and get this product on the shelf. Little did I know that not only was I launching a, you know, product in a company, but also an entirely new category. And I, I was shocked because it was like the, 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 you know, the range of products or the categories of products was water and diet. And, you know, there were enhanced waters like the vitamin waters out there, but, and, and then soda. So a product like mine that didn't really live in a specific category of unsweetened flavored water, way harder, like in the sea of like 2000 beverages, um, you know, basically like we couldn't get into planograms in stores because there was just, there were, yeah. nobody was recognizing it um, as even, you know, something that was needed, something that it had any competitors. And so, you know, I realized early on, um, not prior to launch, but shortly after I launched that I was way ahead of the consumer. I was way ahead of where you know, stores were in terms of, you know, feeling like they needed this product. But the number one reason why I really felt like it, like I was ahead and eventually the consumer would be here is from day one, when we ultimately got it on the shelf at Whole Foods, about six months after I wrote the business plan, Overnight, we sold 10 cases of Hint, and um, I was actually in the hospital delivering my fourth child, which is another story in the book, but it was, um, it was fascinating because we had this 1-800 number and an email on our bottle, and immediately we were getting emails and, and calls into our 1-800 number. Again, there were only like myself and my husband that were at the company. So we'd pick up the phone and talk to these customers. And the response was, oh my gosh, like, where have you been? Like, this product is really helping me to drink water. Um, you're helping me to control this disease that I've, that I've developed called type 2 diabetes. Um, you know, you're helping me get through uh, chemotherapy treatments and cancer. It was all around help. And, and I thought, like, wow. I mean, of all of the jobs that I've had previous to this, and they, they all had mostly goods, a few bads, you know, in them, but never did I hear directly from this consumer that we were helping them. And, you know, I always say to entrepreneurs now, like, if you can call, if, if you can actually do something that helps the consumer, especially when you have down days and things are really, really tough, like when the consumer is writing to you and says like, thank you so much, Kara, like, this is awesome. Like it really helps me. Like you think about how long 
that probably takes to for a consumer to like they've thought about it and then they go to their computer and then they write those emails i mean they must really care right uh, and and so f for me i just felt like those emails even though i was i was ahead were were really giving me the messages that i just had to i just had to hold on and i had to wait in order for for them to catch up to me the rest of them to catch up to me what i find fascinating about that compelling personal story of how you started hint and where that idea came from obviously the book goes into years and years of struggle of ups and downs that's the longer story but in september of 2010 cnbc airs a five minute segment about you and hint it was on a program called how i made my millions and the segment became one of the highest, I think the highest rated segment in the history of that particular series. So that speaks to the power of personal story. And in your book, you say it's really important to bring your personal story into the brand identity. People associate the brand with a human being and that person's story. It adds tremendous meaning and value to them. Can you explore this idea of storytelling and entrepreneurship? And what role does a founder story or an origin story play in the success of a product? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's an interesting topic because I remember so many stories, even you know, when we were starting out where um, we had you know, different individuals, like um, people that we were trying to raise money from, for example, would say to us like, don't actually tell your story because it makes you look very small. And I, and I always thought, okay, so I'm not supposed to tell my story. I mean, you all knew my story. And so the consumer shouldn't know my story. And, and I've thought a lot about this and, you know, that's a great example from the CNBC where um, a woman, you know, saw the commercial where, um, not the commercial, the segment, it was, it went from a 10 minute segment to turning into a half an hour segment that was running constantly on CNBC. And, you know, the fascinating thing is I'm out, I'm out by the pool in Georgia, um, and with my daughter and this woman had seen the segment and she came up to me and said, uh, do you, um, where did you get that drink? And I said, uh, oh, I, I got it down the street at Harris Teeters. And that's when um, she, uh, she said, oh, gosh, you know, I, I just saw this segment with this woman on CNBC. Um, and she's the founder of the company, of course, doesn't recognize me that oh. I'm actually uh, the founder. And I said, really? And I said, what, what was the segment? And of course, I knew exactly what she was talking about. And, uh, and so she went on to share, you know, not exactly my story, but sort of what she had taken out of the story, which was pretty close. And, and I think at that point, it, it really like dawned on me that, that brands that are just starting out and really trying to educate people, people are looking for stickiness, right? Mm -hmm. Beyond just the word, right? And, and beyond sort of, you know, what you ultimately, what is your brand promise? They also wanna know who's behind the brand. And I think that the more information we have as a society, I think that, that, that that's, you know, that is what this consumer will be looking for. And, and as I always, have shared with uh, so many entrepreneurs over the years that that I think it's even it's a way for entrepreneurs to be able to stand out for not a lot of money. Like I I think actually um, getting you know the right PR as well around um, around your around your brand story is is just so critical because that's what people will ultimately. Um, grab onto and gravitate towards. And those big brands that are your competitors, like in the beverage space, they're going to spend millions on commercials and billboards. And, you know, and, and I think at the end of the day, like they don't have a brand story or they had a brand story, but it's so old um, that, you know, they're not continuing to tell that story anymore. Mm -hmm. And so this is a differentiator for a brand. And, and truly, I think it's, it's what consumers are really gravitating towards. I'm so glad you did not take the advice of not to share your story. That could be the single worst 
advice right? I've ever heard. So I'm glad you didn't take it because people don't buy a product. They buy a feeling that the product provides. They buy into the story behind the product. Uh, absolutely. And I, you know, I, I think that that has, I mean, I'd be curious to hear what you think because I, because I really do believe in the last like 15 years, it's become, I can't say that it wasn't happening prior to that, but I think it was less defined. Right. And I, and I think now it just seems essential that I, and I think that, you know, it can work in, you know, reverse too, right. Where if you, if, if you have a founder that doesn't really have a great brand story, but the people maybe like, like the brand, Mm -hmm. I mean, people are, are nervous, right? About those, you know, founders, like they're, you know, or those CEOs too. Like you don't just have to be a founder. I mean, I think it's, it's also, you know, it goes to the next level of being a CEO as well, where I think it's just people want to really understand what they're buying into. And I think it's not just about just having a great product. I think you also can't be like a great founder and a great CEO and have a terrible product and service. Like I think sure. they go hand in hand. Of course, absolutely. But it's, I think it's the story that, as you said, makes you stand out, separates you, gives people a sense of what's behind the product, the why behind the product, uh, totally. helps them understand the company's mission, the, the values of that particular founder. And then when they try it oh and it is good and it is a quality product then it's just the whole package so i i think that storytelling is one of the few uh, really underappreciated aspects of being a successful entrepreneur Uh, and you say it too in your book you've got this wonderful quote uh, one of the reasons that hint became so popular in silicon valley is the founder story people love to connect with a brand with a real human being especially if the person has an interesting and authentic, keyword, authentic, personal narrative that directly relates to the product. Uh, and I think that's, a, that's the key, a- authenticity as well. You had a, just a naturally authentic story to tell. And uh, you probably get tired of telling the story, but people crave the origin yeah. story. Absolutely. And I think that the other thing that people would... Um, would sort of warn me about is that if I tell the story of, you know, like, for example, I'm a mother of four kids and I decided to start this company. And, um, and then there was like the unsweetened flavored product and unsweetened flavored water that I developed. And, you know, they were concerned, like, would it only be applicable to moms? And I'm like, look, I don't define myself as just a mom. It definitely, I'm proud to be a mom. And, you know, and yes, I've got four four kids, but you know what? There's a lot of moms out there in the world too. And I think it's all just goes into the whole authentic, you know, nature of who you are, right? And what you like. And I think people crave um, that kind of communication. And, and, I, and I don't think being a mom, for example, was my why, right? My why was around health and around trying to solve that problem. And so I think like that's the most important thing about the story is like, why did you do it? And, and I think, um, you know, that, and that just continues. I think that, it, that along the way, as, as well as I alluded to before, I think it's, it's um, you know, once you've actually told the story of why you ultimately developed the brand, I think that that just continues with, you know, like, how are you managing during a pandemic? Or, mm-hmm. um, you know, all of the stories just start to continue. And, you know, the, the consumer really, I think, is, is curious about them. And, and I think it just speaks to something else that you and I were chatting about, which is, I really believe that everybody craves learning. Yes. And I think that they may not actually tell you that they crave learning. Um, and they may not define sort of their needs by that. But once people are learning, I think that, and the people that can actually define that they love learning, um, learning doesn't have to just, you know, be sitting down in a classroom or doing online school either. I think it's just people just want to read, want to do this. They just may not know that they ultimately want to be learning. 
let's pick up on that briefly before I before I let you go because I think it's so critical and so important. I'm glad you brought it up in your own book. Uh, you developed a, a lifelong habit of reading, especially when you were in college, and it, it continues today. And you say that I make it a you say I make it a goal to read for at least thirty minutes every day, and that includes books, blogs, news sites. Uh, but you also say that I've met or interviewed many entrepreneurs, and they can all point to a book that inspired them, changed their lives, or positively affected their companies. So I'm glad you focus in your book on the act of reading and how important it is for entrepreneurship. Is there a book or two that has influenced you? Yeah, I mean, so many, but I picked out a few uh, today. Um, one in particular that I just love and I've read over and over again is Trillion Dollar Coach. Um, so this was kind of, um, it was written about- This one, so great, great entrepreneurs think alike. Is that exactly, what you kind of tell Exactly, <laughs> an amazing book. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's a book about, kind of an icon in Silicon Valley, um, who I met once very, very briefly, but I knew many, many people who knew him, um, Bill Campbell, and I wish I would have uh, been able to be mentored by him and, and knew him more. But I think that um, Trillion Dollar Coach really touches on this, this lifelong learning and kind of what he's learned about leading and, and, um, and you know, things like, like really, being sure to listen and and making sure that you know you're guiding in the right way, but not necessarily telling, um, you know. And that that for me, I think, is um, very common sense, perhaps, but it's always at, at every level really appreciated um, to learn um, about about that. And uh, yeah, I mean, I I think that that. Again, like I said, there's so many books that may seem common sense, but I think always, you know, having them as you do on on your bookshelf, just even as reminders when you feel like you're maybe a little lost or you're, you know, trying to figure stuff out, like that's when I'll go back and kind of reread um, some of these different books. And then the other one that is actually a new book um, that was uh, that is written by a friend of mine. Um, and it's called Unapologetically Ambitious. Have you seen this one? Have not read that. Yeah, it's brand I'll, new. I'm writing um, it down Shelley, though. Shelley, Archim, uh, Shelley Archambaugh. And Shelley is actually in a group with me called C200, which is a women's executive um, group. And Shelley's amazing. And uh, she writes about unapologetically ambitious because everybody, uh, Along the way, as she was growing through the ranks, she was the first um, African American C suite executive in Silicon Valley. And, um, and she is not a founder, um, but she has been a CEO of many companies. She's on, I believe, on the board of um, Nordstrom's and a HP and a lot of amazing companies. But, uh, but growing, growing up in, in sort of this role and um, being told that you know, she was too ambitious and she was too this and too that and how she ultimately dealt with that and moved forward. And so many of her messages, I believe, are very similar messages mm -hmm. uh, to my book in terms of like, you know, you're always going to run into people um, that you disagree with and that you don't like and you have to stand your ground and you have to move forward if you ultimately want to achieve something. And having, you know, amazing support system um, as well in place, whether it's groups like C200 or, you know, terrific family and spouses and, and you know, those, those people are, are really, really critical. So that's another book that I would highly recommend. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, there's so many out there, but as you alluded to, I mean, I'm constantly reading. I have, you know, books surrounding me um, at all times. I, I think that's, uh, that that's wonderful because I cannot tell you how many groups that that I speak to uh, made up of of executives and young or business professionals in every field. And when I ask about particular books or or just how many people have, do a lot of reading, very very few hands go up. Uh, yeah. I, I think that reading is underestimated. It's underappreciated. 
but I, I'll tell you, I, I can sense almost immediately when I speak to a leader or a, an entrepreneur who reads more than another because they're more interesting. They pull from different fields and different ideas. They're, they simply are better communicators. I, I think reading has a lot to do with it, but maybe it does come back to what you said earlier, that insatiable curiosity to learn. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, again, it's easier today than it ever was. I mean, I've found myself sometimes when I'm, you know, want something else to listen to, um, you know, on my Alexa or, you know, Echo, that I'll turn on, you know, the audible books, and you can actually start to listen or listen in your car as well. So I think that there is, there are so many ways that frankly, I hadn't thought about before that are even easier. You don't have to carry a physical book anymore. You can have your Kindle or, or whatever, but I, I think also you can listen. And I think that that is, is often, you know, just as great. Well, thank you for writing Undaunted and helping us overcome doubts and doubters. Kara, it's just wonderful to meet you. Thank you so nice much. Nice to meet you too. Thanks, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that conversation and those valuable storytelling tips. For new videos every week, please subscribe. I'll see you next time.